Hello, hello, happy Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, man. I don't even know. I don't even know where I'm at right now. Uh, happy, happy Thursday. Um, it's uh, it, it's it's been an awesome week. It's crazy. I literally just left a meeting in Brooklyn, so I am uh, I, I am like literally just rushing into this. But it seems like we're live and things are uh, things are connecting. So thank you for tuning in. I'm literally just gonna get my. Uh, my little screen up here so I can view your comments as we do this. Hang on one sec. This is the, this is the real deal here. Oh, I got to turn off my audio so it doesn't loop. Um, all right, cool. Screen is legit. Awesome. Thanks, Dillard. Um, listen, you know, for anyone who doesn't know me, I am Brian Cristiano. I run uh, Bold Worldwide. I am the CEO of Bold Worldwide here in New York City. We just recently opened up a location in Miami. We do advertising, marketing, brand strategy, and consulting for brands that really want to take their business from what it's been in the last 10 years to what works today, right? We're talking social, digital marketing, integrations, uh, cross promotion between brands. And, you know, we really focus in on at the end of the day getting results because it's really my strong belief that if you're spending any dollars on marketing and it's just advertising, meaning you're just spending to like put something out into the universe, but it doesn't get you something back, then it's broken. And we're trying to change that discussion, change that narrative and really show what works. And so that's what I'm going to do in the, these lives. That's what I'm going to do today. That's what we're going to do with the Q&A in a little bit. Um, I'm just getting my notes to make sure I don't skip over anything here. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm literally, it's crazy. I literally just like ran in here uh, from a previous meeting. So it's been, uh, it's it's a little, I'm a little uh, flustered, but like in a good way, man, I'm excited. I'm excited to chat today. So look, you know, we, we launched Growing Bold episode five this week. I'm curious how many of you saw it. Uh, I'd love for you to say, if you did see Growing Bold episode five, comment, let me know that you've seen it. Or if you haven't seen it, say no. I'll roll in a little clip of it in a minute here, but my motivation for doing these videos, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything in this video at all, right? My motivation is that I really genuinely feel strongly, my agency feels strongly that there is such a misconception about what works and what doesn't work in advertising, marketing, and business in 2017 and moving forward versus the way everyone has done it for so long. And it's not necessarily a lot of people's faults, it's just that there's a lot of misinformation. You have the big, huge ad agencies and media companies that have vested interests in keeping things the same, that are putting out (laughs) studies and material and communication that, oh, all of the traditional stuff still works when it truly it does not. And it's even just more expensive than it ever has been. And it doesn't work. Then you have on the flip side, a lot of people who are teaching social media and digital marketing who have never really done it before for a company and they're giving bad advice. And so we're doing this every single day for clients. We're a growing company. We're, we're, we're working on growing to a hundred million dollars. Um, but it's not going to happen by just getting new clients and new customers, right? It, there's two pieces to this for us at Bold and the way that I look at business. There's new business, which is going to grow us, but there's also retention and keeping clients happy. And so while in one sense, I can completely understand that people might think, well, if you're just going to go and grow a company and get a bunch of new clients, do you care about the current ones you have? Here's the reality. The more that we grow and the more that we learn, have access to capital growth, really smart talent, really super smart digital people and strategists um, and folks that really understand what works today, the more value we're able to deliver for our current clients. And so it only benefits our clients for us to continue our growth. And so for me, it's it has to be both. You have to get new clients, um, but then you also have to retain and even improve what you're doing for your current clients. And so that's our goal because I genuinely know that if we even do a better job for current clients, not only are they going to stay around, but they're going to refer us to other brands and other companies that need our services, right? And we work with companies as large as Fortune 500s and then other companies, you know, in, in somewhere in the middle there. Um, but this advice, everything that I'm talking about applies whether you are a CMO of a Fortune, Fortune 100 company or if you're an entrepreneur starting your own thing from scratch. It's just the only real difference, the principles are all the same. The only real difference is that it's, it, the scale is different. You know, the amount of money you can spend and maybe some of the things that you can execute on might be different, but all the principles remain the same. So it doesn't matter where you're starting from. 
I want to have the conversation with you to say, hey, look, this is what we see. This is what we know works. And this is how you can implement it. And that's, that's the whole idea behind these live episodes every Thursday. Um, so I'm going to check in on your comments here. Does Bold focus on sports and lifestyle brands? Uh, we had traditionally focused only on sports and lifestyle. We have expanded beyond that. Um, but we still work with a lot of companies that are sports, fitness, lifestyle, health, wellness, things that are in that nature because they're fun and they're things that we know really well. But we also have brands that are well outside of those verticals. And uh, thank you for everyone who has watched the episode. For anyone that hasn't, I'm just going to roll in a quick little short clip here uh, from Growing Bold episode five, just like 30 or 60 seconds. And, uh, and then we'll chat about it a little bit. Some of the things that I've learned and some tips for business and marketing that applies to your company and your brand. Media. Instagram, also owned by Facebook, one of the best platforms up and coming, $4.44 CPM. You can reach 10, 12 times the amount of people for the same money, but here's the difference. I can tell you without a doubt how many people actually saw that ad. When I say a thousand people for five dollars saw your ad, a thousand people actually saw it. But so we target it to the right people that we think are going to be the most likely customers and we get, let's say, I'll call it a million views, make the numbers easier. Oh, we got a million views. I do not give a shit about a million people that watch that video. I don't care. You know what I care about? I care about the 100,000 that watched 100% of that video. I know you now know my company, now you know my brand, know my product, and I know you're at least intrigued about something that we just showed you. So that's just a little quick clip there from uh, Growing Bold episode five. Um, there's a couple things I wanna talk about based on that episode, some of the content that's in there, and some of the things that I and we at Bold have seen and learned from actually doing this content ourselves. Um, the first thing really for me is is persistence, right? I think there's a lot of people, a lot of brands, big and small, that put out something. They do some sort of piece of content or you know, a marketing campaign or a slogan or a new website. And then they might not necessarily get the traction from day one. And so they're already thinking about how, what they're going to change. But the truth is the persistence is the most important thing that you can do as a brand, as a business, as a marketer, as a salesperson, is to stay consistent and persistent. Because if you're not, no one's going to remember the message that you had. Think about this. How many times has Nike changed the just do it slogan? Never. That's why we all know it. If Nike every two or three years said, hey, we're going to rebrand and come up with some other tagline that fits the decade, that fits the day, the age, no one would ever remember just do it. And so you have to think about your company, your store, your brand. While to you it might feel like you're being repetitive, the reality is once you have that messaging that you know really truly mirrors your company and your brand, you have to go all in on continuing to hammer it into people's minds for not just months, not just weeks, not even just years, decades. That's how people remember your brand. That's how people remember Nike and just do it. Um, it's, it's, it really comes down to the level of persistence, right? And, it's, and it's, it's both a short-term and a long-term play because the truth of the matter is there's a lot of companies that throw tons of money into advertising or branding and they can't even tell you if it works. You don't even know if it's actually impacting your company. Do we get more sales out of it? I don't know, but people said they saw it. Does that matter? Well, if it's creating a long-term value and long-term awareness for your brand and people are going to remember it five years, 10 years, even a couple of months from now, there's value there. But at the same time, if your marketing isn't driving actual sales, increasing your bottom line, something tangible leads, something that your business can use to actually grow, then you're doing marketing wrong. Marketing isn't just about saying, hey, we're going to put an ad somewhere and hope that it does something. No, marketing needs to directly correlate to your bottom line and the growth of your company because if you're not growing, you're dying. And so at the end of the day, it's both. Marketing and advertising really has to be, what's our story? How are we telling what's true to us to the people and the consumers and the customers that should do business with us? But making sure that that, that story resonates, there's emotion, it's not just the facts about what you do or the facts of the products you sell. It's about the story behind them and why, the why. Why, why does this product do what it does? Why do you do what you do? Why does your company exist? Tell that story consistently and persistently over and over and over again so people remember you, but simultaneously, you need to make sure in the short term, 
You're also increasing your sales as that happens. Otherwise, what are you doing, right? Facebook's not going to solve all of your problems if you say, hey, I know Facebook ads is the solution. It's the new thing. Yes, it works when everything else is aligned. But it's not going to have a big impact if you don't really know your story or you're not willing to tell your story. Because a lot of you are afraid to tell your real story, whether that's personal, whether that's your brand, your company. You want to manufacture some mystical story, a mythical story about your company about the things you want people to think about you. I, mean, I, I, I saw an airline billboard. I won't name the, the, the airline because they all suck. <laughs> but I saw an airline billboard the other day. First of all, a billboard. <laughs> okay, right? Second of all, the billboard said, you know, it was like <laughs> the most consistent departure times of any airline. Wow, what a low bar that they just set. Not... We give great customer service or we do something. Most consistent. And guess what? Most consistent is complete and utter garbage. The, the bar is low. The bar is really low because they're trying to manufacture, make people feel and think that they're actually consistent, that you show up and you're going to get on their airline and they're going to take off. Trust me, I fly it all the time. And at least 50% of the time is delayed. It's late. They canceled it. Blah, blah, blah. And not due to like actual weather or mechanics. Just because of poor communication, poor logistics of the airline industry. And it's not necessary. There, there's a lot of politics. I, I can go way down the rabbit hole. But what I'm getting at is they're trying to manufacture a story about telling you how amazing that they are being able to take off on time, but yet they're missing 50 or 60% of their takeoffs. Come on, man. You're making up crap. Tell me a story. Like, why? Like, tell me something that actually matters to me as a human being that's not just BS you're, you're trying to make me think that you do that when you actually don't. Tell me the real stuff. Tell me the motivation behind what the airline is, who the people that work there, the reason it was started, the vision of where you see air travel in the future. I want to know about that. That's where I can emotionally get on board. But people are too afraid to tell that story because now you're, now you're making an opinion. You're calling something for what it is. You're being honest. You're lifting the curtain, so to speak. You're, you're telling people the truth. And that can be scary. But the truth is where the most power is in marketing and advertising. I don't want your fake story. I don't want you to tell me how magical your stuff is. If it's not magical, you should probably fix it. But tell me, tell me the motivation. Tell me the, the emotional why I should be invested in your product or your service. Tell me that story. That's what's going to have an impact. That's what's going to get me to come back as a customer and a consumer in the long run and do business with you in the short term. That's exactly what we're doing with these Growing Bold episodes, right? We're telling the real story. And a lot of people like it. I got to say, you know, we're five, you know, four and a half weeks into this, five episodes in. And I got to say, you know, I'm not patting ourselves on the back. I got to say the response has been overwhelmingly positive, which has been incredible for myself and my team that's putting it on. You know, kudos to them for making it look and sound and feel the way that it does. But there's also been a little hate. There's been a little hate, man. Maybe 10% or so. People want to people want to crap on it. People want to tell you you're doing something wrong. People want to compare me or or the work that we're doing to some other person. First of all, it's flattering. But second of all, people want to tear you down. People want to tell you how bad the thing is or that they don't agree with your perspective or that you cuss too much. I'm sorry that I cuss, man, but I'm not doing it at you. It's just fun. <laughs> I'm living some life a little bit, man. I'm living a little bit of life. Right? I'm not worried about a word or two. It's just, you know what words are? You know what curse words are? You know what an F-bomb is? It's literally the vibration of your vocal cords sending out sound waves into the air. It's nothing more than that. What you perceive that word to mean is your choice and your belief of what that word really means. Again, I digress. That's a whole other conversation for a different day. But we put in, we're putting things into perspective here on this, on this episode, on this live, this Facebook live. The haters come out, man. When you, when you do something that most people aren't comfortable with, most people aren't willing to put a stake in the ground, make an entire show, put money, time, and investment, show the behind the scenes of their agency, show how they're doing their sales processes, and say, we're going to get to 100 plus million dollars, and I'm going to show you how. Most people would never do that. We're willing to do that. I'm putting it all on the line. I'm willing to say that and make that claim because I'm going to do it. And if I don't, you're going to see it anyway. So it should be a little entertaining either way, right? But when you make a claim that, that that's that big, that's that uncomfortable, 
that most people would never say. People are like, oh man, you know, you really shouldn't say that. It makes you sound like you're all about the money. I'm not about the money. Yeah, of course. Like, let, well, let's be honest, right? Like money's a good thing. You, you, it creates freedom. I'm not doing this for the hundred million dollars. I'm doing this because I know that our company, our agency has something different to bring to the marketplace that's better than 99% of the marketplace. And if I don't grow this company to hundred million dollars, shame on me. Shame on me for not doing it. Because if I've got something that's better, that can help other companies grow, that can employ hundreds and maybe thousands of people here, but I don't really go for it. I don't make that claim. I don't tell that story. I'm not real. Then what am I, dude? There's no backbone in that. Right? But listen, back to the haters. I've learned so much through this. And it's been one of the best case studies in a five-week period of time for all the things I tell my clients to do that they hesitate on. They go, oh, you know, what everyone, here's what everyone says to do, right? When you put out content or you put out an ad or you tell them something real or you take a pers- per, you know, position in the world as a company, a person, or an entrepreneur, and then people hate against it, you know what everybody says to do? They say to ignore it. Ignore the haters, man. They're just trolls. Don't talk to them. When you talk to them, you give them a voice. That's what people without a backbone do. They don't address the situation. They just ignore it. The other thing everybody says to do is like either ignore it or you, know, you block them or you come up with a very standardized, corporatized response where you say, listen, I'm sorry that you didn't like it. We're not trying to be offensive, but bop, bop, bop. And you know what that does? That just fuels up the haters even more. This is what you really do. You're dealing with haters on a personal level. You're dealing with haters on a corporate level because you're, you're taking a stance. You're telling a real story. Some people don't like it. First of all, if you're not getting the haters, then you're not taking a stand. You're not making a claim, which means you're playing in the middle and everything in the middle dies. The middle is the most dangerous place to live in life. It's boring. The middle is the most dangerous place to play in business because mediocrity dies. When the market comes down, all the people playing in the middle lose everything the people playing a big game they might lose a little bit off the top but in the long run they're going to get bigger and we saw that in 2008 2009 you you can call it whatever whatever you want to call it but that's that's the reality because they were playing a bigger game now i feel bad for the people that lose the stuff in the middle but when you're playing in that middle when you say and you actually say look we're not going to respond to our haters we're just going to ignore them you know, you do, you're playing in the middle. When you get haters because they don't like what you're saying, like what you're doing, like what you're showing, like what you're marketing, like what your business stands for, and you just say, hey, we're going to block them or we're going to give them this standardized message that we're comfortable with. You're playing in the middle. No one likes the middle. No one says, hey, when I grow up, I want to be super mediocre. You didn't. I didn't. Nobody does that. But as we get older, we get scared of what other people think of us. That's all hate is, man. People are scared of what other people are talking about. And it's timely too, man, because there's so much freaking hate. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. I don't, I don't need to get into the whole political thing. I'm not political. I hate politics. I think it's a waste of people's time, energy, unless you want to be a politician and actually make some changes. But the reality is, dude, the, the hate that's going on in the world, the stuff that's going on, it's disgusting. You know what stops that? People actually standing up for it. So, so, so I'll take this down a couple notches. I'll talk about the haters, right? The 10% of the commenters that compare me to somebody else. I've had somebody say, you're a piece of shit. I hope you go bankrupt and lose it all. Most people's first reaction is like, oh my God. Oh my God, that hurts so much. How can anybody say that? Two things happen to me because I have a different mindset. One is I go, <laughs> that's freaking funny, dude. That's amazing. And then it fires me up because I'm like, oh my God, dude. I can't wait to shove it in this dude's face who told me he can't wait to see me go bankrupt. And I'm like, hey, bro, it's still five years later and we're at $250 million and still growing. How you doing? What are you doing? Because I picture the person on the other side of that keyboard is just a sweaty loser with nothing better to do. I don't have time to comment on other people's Facebook posts, especially not negatively. You know why? Because I'm building my own thing. I'm creating the thing that I have a vision for, that I believe in, that I know I can do. I'm busy. I'm too busy for that. So if you've got time to comment negatively, dude, you got to get busier. You got to find something better to do. So first of all, I just laugh at them. I picture them as just this total loser. And then I just go like, ha ha, I'm going to work harder now. But the other part of this is what I realize that nobody talks about. Nobody says this. 
Dude, haters are just fans that don't know you yet. Haters, I'll say that again. Haters are just fans that don't know you yet. They're hating on you because they saw one clip of a video. Dude, there's no context. They don't know me. They don't know you. What are you worried about, man? So it gives you an opportunity to turn them into a fan. I address every single hater that comments, DMs me. Regardless of where it comes in from, I address every single one of them head on. I don't call them a piece of garbage. They're calling me a piece of garbage and want to see me go bankrupt. And I go, hey, dude. Well, that was a real nice compliment. Thank you, question mark. But uh, appreciate the view anyway. You know what happens in that moment? Two things. One, people go, oh, crap, this guy actually responded. Because you know why, dude? They're used to everyone else not responding. So they get to just throw their little bombs because they know no one's ever going to talk to them. They're, no, they're not getting a real person to respond to them. So when a real person like me actually responds, they're like, whoa, 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 shit. I forgot there's actually a human on the other side of this Facebook account. So they take it down a couple notches usually. We might even get in some tiffs and back and forth. And the key is just say cool and calm, dude. And just remind yourself. Like, dude, maybe in that moment they had nothing better to do. Or maybe they were intrigued by something because if they watched and they commented, there's something you said that intrigued them enough to open up the door to a conversation. And now it's your job to turn them from a hater into a super fan. And you know what happens, which is kind of incredible? Most people back down and say, all right, hey, man, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to be that rude. Or they might continue a little bit and you just go, hey, look, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for watching. Let me ask you a question. What would you change to the so next time you actually might watch? You know, it's really crazy. I want to say that a good 80% of the people that have commented negatively or hate every 80% of all those people that I have responded to have been like, hey, you know, sorry, DMing. Somebody just, somebody said something real nasty the other day on Facebook. I responded to them. Then they DM me, hey, man, sorry, I didn't mean for it to come across so negatively. Had a couple just honest back and forth. And they was like, hey, man, I'm trying to work on this thing on my business. I just see so much crap on Facebook that's so like people just kind of trying to hawk garbage, not really adding value or like just yapping, making videos of themselves to prove that they just like exist, not to give any real value, right? A lot of phony stuff. And he's like, dude, you're real. Like, here's what I'm trying to do in my business. Like, what, you know, has a couple questions. Dude, we're now connecting. We're having a real human to human conversation. Haters are just people that you haven't, figure out how to turn into a fan that's it man that's literally it don't be afraid of them don't be afraid most people aren't that mean they're just used to everyone ignoring them because that's what the status quo is that's what you're told to do when you respond man you stick out and if you could take somebody that came in the door not liking you and they leave loving you or at least neutral to you or hey okay i respect this i get what you're trying to do Man, how powerful is that? That's more powerful than taking somebody that, you know, once saw you and liked you right away. That's way more powerful. I, uh, man, that was, that was fun. That went to like a, a crazy little rant there. Um, it's nuts. It's nuts. Listen, by the way, before I forget, because I totally forgot to mention this at the top of this live, I'm doing this live every Thursday at 1 p.m. Every Thursday, 1 p.m., tune in. We're going to do this. We're going to talk more. Going to get more in depth. Going to open it up to Q&A in a minute here. Um, and every Tuesday, we're dropping the Growing Bold episode. So keep an eye out for that. And then there's we're doing a lot of little other bits of content in between. But those are the two days. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Thursdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, this live show. So with that, I am going to open this up for questions. Q&A, Q&A. Who's got some questions? What can I help you with? What are you wondering about? Business, marketing, sales strategy? Just questions about the show, questions about me? Total AMA, anything you, anything you wanna know, let me know. Drew, what's up? What's up, man? Joel, see you next Thursday. Looking forward to it, Joel. Isaac, keep talking, okay. Who cares? I don't know, man. I don't know who cares. I don't know what the context of that comment was. Maybe you're talking about who cares about the haters. I'm not sure. Uh, life is, uh, Dylan, life is 10% what happens, 90% how you, how you react. Dude, everything's just how you react. Everything is the belief that you give it. Just like I was kind of like going off on the little cuss word thing, right? Some people are upset about that. Like, dude, you curse too much. It's not professional. It's just words, man. It's just vibrations in the air. It really doesn't mean anything. It's the belief that you attach that has some negative connotation. Because look, you can say a curse word and it'd be really mean and nasty and intentional. 
I'm not dropping an F-bomb to be nasty intentional. I'm dropping an F-bomb because I get excited and I drop F-bombs because I just want to live life. I just want to have fun. I don't want to have to show up in a corporate environment and suit. That's why I have my own company so I can build an environment and surround myself with people that I want to be around all day. You spend more than 50% of your life in work, you might as well go somewhere and spend that energy and time doing something productive and fun in an environment that you actually want to be in. That's why I'm growing bold. Seriously, that at the end of the day is what it is because I would never last in a corporate environment. Okay, let's get to some questions. Uh, Drew, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in business today? The biggest opportunity in business today is insane, incredible customer service and experience. Nobody's doing it. Everyone assumes that all of the retail market share, all the, sh- all of the sales market shares heading over to Amazon because like e-commerce is killing retail. Dude, retail killed retail. You don't gain anything by going into most retailers other than they might have the product. Get bad customer service. No one knows what they're talking about. They don't have your size. They don't have the thing that you want. They don't have the color. Nobody can figure anything out. They're not helping you. They're not problem solving. So why bother, dude? Just order it on Amazon. It'll be at your door the next day. The technology obviously is a catalyst to it. But the main problem is that there's no experience. There's no customer service. Customer service and experience can be the number one thing. When we fast forward five, seven, 10 years from now, all of the companies that have poor customer service, that don't add any value or experience when you walk in the door, they will all be gone or consolidated. And you'll have one side that's very heavy, e-com, digital, whatever, social purchasing at that time. And then the other side, you have very customer-centric very experiential type of sales business and retail. That's that's the killer. That's going to be the key. Okay. Oh, man. You guys are flowing in the questions, man. This is exciting. I love it. I love it. When you present packages, do you start with the highest or lowest option? I think it's a massive mistake for people. And, and I used to do this as well. We come in and like, okay, here's the A package, the B package, the C package. And everybody knows that the reality is your, your A package is the super cheap one. It doesn't really give enough value. So it's not justified. Everyone knows the C package is way more expensive than they're going to take. So you kind of get them where you want. And the B, dude, everybody knows that. It doesn't work. What I do is I come in, we do a complete audit and an analysis of the brand and the company, what are you trying to do? What is the goal? What are the results that you are trying to get? And we work backwards and say, this is what's going to help you get there. Period. End of story. I don't present multiple options. I present the option that we feel strongly that will actually help the client get to where they want to go and get the results that they want. Zach Walters, this is the best automated webinar I've ever seen. Ha ha. Clearly it ain't automated, Zach. What's up, buddy? You can't probably see that. Ain't automated, man. This is true live, true live. <laughs> um, Christy, first time watching him. It was Steven yesterday. Looking forward to catching up bold. Yes. Christy, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. Thanks for the comment. I love it. Looking forward to talking with you as well. Michael, how can we link up and establish a true human connection? Have a nice foundation, but without affiliate marketing. Just put yourself out there. Do what I'm doing, man. I mean, literally, like you can do it in a different way. Maybe it's in person. Maybe it's, you know, lives. Maybe it's content. Maybe it's video, phone calls. Like, just you just got to connect, like, on a, on a one-to-one, even if it's scaled out like this, where obviously a bunch of us are, 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 you know, communicating simultaneously. It really is. It's just the communication. It's just let's talk. Let's, let's have a coffee. Let's have a conversation. Let me help you. Let me give you some information. Let me get you to know me on a personal level. Let me tell you the real story, my real motivation. Let me get to know you a little bit. That's it, dude. It's really it. So, Technology and social allows us to do that faster and more scale than five or 10 years ago. I wouldn't have been able to do this, but it's just a, it just essentially accelerates the ability to do what you would just do one-to-one. Matt, can I shadow you, shadow you for a week? I would love to do that. I mean, my schedule is just probably a little bit too crazy to realistically let somebody shadow me. But, uh, you know, we can definitely DM me. We can definitely see if there's something I can do. Like maybe uh, maybe get you on a little call, ask, answer some questions, or you can shoot me an email or something like that. Just DM me. We'll, we'll talk about it offline. 
Okay, Andrew Lee, what is your business's primary tactic for prospecting? Cold calling, social messaging, door to door, something else, all of it, everything, everything, everything is every possible way to connect with a customer, you must do it. Especially in a service industry that we're talking about complex sales. We're not talking about selling a, you know, a pair of sunglasses, pretty straightforward. We're talking about something that impacts business that requires input from a client before we can actually truly give them a recommendation. It's a very, it's a big, big relationship we need to build and a lot of trust. Um, and so it's everything. It's cold calls. It's going to events. It's setting up meetings. It's getting drinks. It's going to events. It's emails. It's LinkedIn messages. It's this content. It's Facebook ads. It's writing a letter. It's everything, dude. It's everything. Keith, great stuff, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. What level of importance would you give video in marketing a business? Oh, dude, video is it. That's why we're doing so much. Here's the thing, right? Before I mention, like, listen, you know, you, you, you've got ad agencies who, who, who are, you know, holding on to the old thing because they have vested interests in the old media, which is the truth. But also, ask yourself a serious question. When was the last time an advertising agency advertised on TV or radio, etc.? cetera? Uh, never. <laughs> so you're, doing, you're allowing somebody else to tell you and dictate what your business is going to do, but they're not going to do it for themselves? There's something wrong there. That would be like going to the Apple store and people have Android phones who work there. You wouldn't believe in the company. We, on the other hand, are literally doing what we're telling our clients to do. We're making content, we're pushing it out daily, we're scaling it out, we're, we're getting on the ground and doing meetings, we're doing you know, content, we're doing lessons, this stuff, we're doing private stuff with certain clients, right? We are, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing talk, speaking engagements, we're creating our weekly video series that is a true, real story, behind the scenes look for our, to our motivations of what it is that we do, and we're, pu we're putting it out on Facebook and Instagram and social and digital, and we're putting paid media behind it on Facebook, we're literally doing exactly what we tell clients to do. We're, we're living and breathing it, so it's, it's, it's you know, <laughs> Um, I kind of got, oh, video. So so we're living and breathing it. I wouldn't be doing this, Facebook Live. I wouldn't be doing a weekly show. We wouldn't be putting out every day a piece of video content plus other content if I didn't think video was the shit. It is. It is. Video is more important than it ever has been because people can connect with you. You can tell a real story. You're not limited to 15 or 30 seconds. It can be five seconds or it can be 10 minutes. Video is massive. All right, Angelos, how do you get a new client for an agency, networking conference? I just kind of answered that. Uh, Rudy, I'm starting to understand custom audiences. Do they have them on LinkedIn? LinkedIn does not have the depth that Facebook has. We're talking about custom audiences. Now, there are other data sources for LinkedIn. Um, one of my people on my digital team would know a little bit more than I would specifically. I can get real deep on the Facebook side and Snapchat, et cetera. But on LinkedIn, um, I honestly don't really find as much value on the paid side on LinkedIn as I do on Facebook, even B2B, like real high level sales B2B. Okay. Um, All right there, man, Michael. Things are getting too robotic. People are seeing a gray state. They want to feel compassion, connection. Yeah, 100%, man. People want compassion. They want emotion. They want to connect with you on a human level, right? Like just a transactional level is, is it, you're just the commodity, right? The emotion is where you're no longer a commodity. Okay, Dylan, what's the first step you bring to your product to do a new marketing area? My company's based out of Denver. I'm trying to tap into Northern Colorado market. Uh, Dylan, hit uh, respond with what it is that you do. What is your product and who do you sell to? And I'll try to answer that in a minute. Brad, what do you say people say it's really not about the price? What do you say to people when the, who say it's really not about the price? Uh, Brad, give me more context on that. You meaning like you're, you're, you're selling, like you're in a sales pitch and they say it's not about the price, like the reason why they're not going to buy from you. Give me a little bit more context on that. I'll answer that one as well. Isaac, I'm marketing for a plumbing company and trying to wrap my mind around creating content that resonates with my business, unsexy as it is. What would you do to add value? Teach people the things that they can do from a plumbing perspective to you know, DIY stuff, man. Like, hey, listen, like this might be a problem. Like if your sink does this or has this issue, here's what you can do about it. And I'm so-and-so with such XYZ plumbing company and I'm here to teach you how to do it, how to fix it. 
now you're giving me value. And that's something that people who might have that issue, Google it, look it up, try to find a video, try to fix it themselves. And you might feel like, hey, well, you've given out all the information, they're not going to hire you. It's okay because they're going to have the big stuff that they're not going to be able to do themselves, right? So that's what I would do there. Justin, what is a good marketing strategy if you didn't have a physical product? For example, church. Um, it's all about the community, right? So you got to get people, you got to get people, What you know, when you're talking about a church or you're just talking about, you're essentially just talking about a community of people that believe something specific, right? So all you need to do is you need to have your community at the forefront, going out, having the other members, go and bring other people in, having, you know, uh, you, you know, putting on an event, putting on events, getting involved in the local community uh, so that people get to know you, come, you know, come in, uh, you know, get to see if, if their beliefs align with your beliefs, have a discussion with them, get really on the human level. So it's just about really getting as involved in the community as much as possible. Okay. Cody. What's up, Cody? Love the video series. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Uh, what's the best way to get customers in a storefront? We have done tons of promoting, but bigger competitors are beating us out. Well, uh, Cody, what kind of a what kind of a shop? What kind of a store? Connor, how many years do you think it'll take to get to 100 million? I want to do it in a year, but let's be realistic. I think we can do it in like three-ish years, three to four, like for real. But I want to do it in a year. We're going for it, like in a 12-month span, right? We're going for it, but um, I'm also a little realistic. It might take a couple of years. Might take a few years. It's not going to be a long time though. Does uh, Drew does Bull work with sport, clients outside of sporting goods? Uh, sports sporting goods? Yes, yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, we 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 traditionally had really focused on that one vertical. We've now grown and expanded uh, because we really found that what we do best is you know we obviously have a lot of vertical experience, um, but the reality is is that at the end of the day we just really get results and we work on a more consultancy type of a basis, which most ad agencies don't do. Uh, we're really pushing our clients into the things that we know work and not telling them to do things that don't just because we have no vested interests in any industry. Um, and so we've really approached, reapproached it from that angle to bring what we've done to this point out to the bigger, broader market. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that too as well. Dylan, how do you target that select group instead of the masses? Um, I'm trying to remember what the uh, context there was, but uh, let me just scroll up. Let me scroll up. Um, well, anyway, I, lo I lost it. I can't find that. But uh, how do you target a select group instead of the masses? I mean, Facebook advertising, man, you can hone in as small as you want. You can geo-target. You can likes, interests, things they've done, uh, look-alike audience modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Man, you can get really, really granular if you need to. Still in suggestion, get a phone in there. People can call live. Yeah, dude, actually, that's awesome. This is only the second, third one we've done live, really second one, really, with consistency. We're actually talking about that. We're going to plan on it. Actually... That's actually a good poll. I'm curious if we did like a call in or a live Skype where we could add you in and answer like one to one work through some of your problems. How would you, you know, it was, is that would be that be something that you would be interested in? Say yes in the comments if you would be interested in doing like a live call in part of the show. Cool. Thanks for the suggestion. And yeah, we're, we're on it, man. Um, and by, by the way, by the way, if, uh, if you guys, feel like there's value here i'd love it if you shared the stream um just because it helps grow the audience and give more value and the bigger that this thing continues to to grow the more i'm going to be able to do stuff and, and, and create more infrastructure we can do call-ins live skypes maybe do a live interview multi-camera i'm not sure but you know it, it helps me out obviously when you share it and uh, only do it though if you find it valuable um zach what do I do with an audience that is generating hyper organically 800 leads a month, but it's a niche where something I'm not an expert in. How do I serve them? I feel like I'm not, I'm wasting an opportunity, but I want to be careful not to drown in it. Um, to do with an audience. Yeah. I mean, look, just do research, figure out what you can do with those leads or if, or if the idea is to get more than 800 leads and figure out like, how are they getting the leads now? How can you do more of that? Or how can you scale that? Or how can you add more value to that? Or if you're trying to t convert those leads into sales, what are their motivation? Why do they become leads, right? Just do your research. You don't have to necessarily start as an expert, but you need to become an expert. And it's just about the research, about asking questions, reach out to some of those leads, reach out to past customers. Dillard. 
I have no idea how to run a drop shipping company myself, but I'm doing it slowly, surely teaching myself. All the matters are just starting to teach yourself. Awesome. Yeah. Drop shipping, man. That's awesome. If you're into it, if you can find the right partners that have a great product and you can market it online, I know a lot of people that do very well. Um, just be smart about the types of products that you're marketing and the people that you're, that are doing the drop shipping to make sure that it actually shows up when it's supposed to. JJ Simmons is in the building. Awesome, man. Awesome. Thanks for jumping in here. Our main company is MMA promotion, but we have a supplement company tied to that I run. Cool, man. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, let me just, uh, let me just scroll up again, Dylan. Okay. Uh, new, new, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Right. So you, you're the one in Denver or Colorado. You want to, you want to scale out. You want to get a little bit bigger, go farther. You have an MMA promotions company and a supplement company tied to that. Yeah. I mean, look, I think it's two things. One, if you're talking about e-commerce and sales, Facebook ads to the regions that you want to get some traction in. One, two, maybe you can set up like an event or piggyback on an event where people can see the supplements, try it, uh, you know, MMA promotion. I don't know if you can bring a fighter there or do something or a demo, but get the people in those communities involved on a literal, like, you know, in the same room with you or, or your company or people and your products, and then use a thing like Facebook to really hyper-target it and tell people that they should come, make it free or, you know, give them a really good reason to show up, and then they get introduced to you. They get introduced your brand and your product, and then they're talking about it, assuming that it's a good product, um, and now you've kind of started to take over a little bit of, little bit of space in that area, and then you, you can grow from there. Okay, Jeff, more customers to a storefront. Social media, vaping company, we have no website at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I think for that, because it's so specific, you need to go in your community where those people are. People who, you know, who vape for whatever reason, you know, where are they hanging out? Where where are they? Get involved with them on a one-to-one -one level. Do something at the storefront, right? Like try some products out or partner up with like, I don't know, a lo local coffee company if people like to have some coffee too while they vape or something. I don't know. Like what are the things that you can do that can create an experience at your storefront and then tell everyone in the community that might be interested in that to come and show up? Dylan, uh, building frames, high in artwork target galleries and artists right now product service is more geared towards them yeah i mean you could definitely target let's say on facebook you could target people uh that are interested in high-end art in by area location etc or people that are friends with different galleries but i think that that's kind of the same thing too or you need to kind of see it and feel it so try to maybe partner up with a couple of galleries right maybe you can do something where it's mutually beneficial doesn't really cost you much you put on some events at the galleries you know you make a big deal you do something really cool or unique or interesting with the frame itself becomes a piece of art right and now you kind of build that story because in the art world i'm not like super big in that world but i have some friends who are and my understanding at least is that it's kind of like you know they want it wants you want to feel like it's underground and you're in the know and so if you do like broadcast type of marketing where everybody's hearing about it it kind of takes the cool out of it so i would say like partnering up with those galleries and trying to do something really cool you bring people in and then you get to know them and you tell a story about your frames okay nick what are your thoughts on effective online marketing, oversaturated local market, Florida real estate? Yeah, Florida real estate is a little bit crazy, but um, I want to know you because what's going to separate, you know, the one salesperson from, you know, that, that I'm going to do business with to do my deal or to buy a place or to sell a place versus you is you. I want to know you, dude. So you need to you need to give me behind the scenes tours and looks. Um, you should become like the expert in, in whatever the specific thing that you sell or you do or the houses or properties that you're involved with. If there's a piece of a niche or something that you know better than everyone else, you need to get that out there and you need to tell your story. You need people to like you as a person and build the trust. So then the next time I'm thinking about buying or selling, I'm like, oh man, I got to connect with Nick. That's it. Jeff, love the series. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Yes, 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 yes. Call in. All right. So you guys definitely want to call in. Jake Mahani is in the house. Super Facebook marketer there. Um, <laughs> what's up, Jake? Welcome. Uh, Drew, how do you balance brand marketing direct response when you take over brands marketing department? It's a balance, right? You need to tell the story. It's all about story. That is branding. That is emotion. That is what's going to get people to connect with it, right? And so what, what, what I do, what we do is we really try to, you know, 
Think of it in multiple tiers, multiple parts of a funnel where you know, you're know you creating branding on the top, something with a great story, some visuals, some imagery, some video that's telling me a story. And then you're, you're trying to get those people to look at other content, to poke through your site, to read other stuff, to look at other articles. And you track all that. And then you mark it back to those people in the right time and space based on data of, hey, they're probably ready to buy or they're really poking down the rabbit hole here. Let's give them an offer. Let's get them into our funnel. Let's get them on our list, right? And then that way, because you don't want to just jam buy our stuff in front of everyone's face because they're probably not ready to buy right away. But you also don't want to just stick with just the top level branding because then if you never give them an opportunity to buy, people need to be nudged. People need to be nudged to purchase. Do you actively practice SEO, Steve? Yeah, I mean, SEO is kind of important, but I don't think it's as impactful as it used to be. Um, My view of SEO is it's pretty 101 in my book. Like in my, honestly, like it sounds crazy. I find like SEO is just like common sense. Like think of it just from the perspective of what would you search for? Okay, cool. Like (laughs) make sure that if that's something important to your business, that you have content and videos and web pages specifically talking about that. To me, that's like the end of the story. When people try to game that system and write content, content specifically for like blog posts like oh we need these three keywords in a blog post and we're going to write around it like dude you're you're missing the point you might be able to grab somebody because maybe you you ranked a little bit higher on the click but they're not going to sit around and read it if the content is garbage but you just use it as like essentially clickbait for seo people will stick around pass around you know if your content is good enough if your blog post is good enough your video your website and so what you need to do is make sure that that comes first and then just know the basics of seo Share it all, my man. Awesome. Um, ba, 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 ba. Cool. If you know how to draw leads, focus on specialty. Cool. Can you start up solely on drop ship? Could you start up solely on drop shipping? Um, I'm not like a real drop shipper. That's not my deal. That's not my space. But I would definitely say like, um, there's there's massive opportunity there for the right products with the right partners, um, marketed the right wh- way. All right, I'll take a few more questions and I'm going to have to wrap it up here in a handful of minutes. In regards to B2B marketing, going for sponsorships, couple of challenges you face to try and find new clients. Can you give advice, startup standpoint, selling services for bigger, more established companies? You got to show some level of result or you got to show something new that they haven't seen that they're not getting currently from one of their other partners or internally. That's really the two angles. Either I've got something new that you've never done or can't do, or I've got some crazy results because of, you know, that you're not getting because we do something different than this thing that you're doing, right? So you gotta, you, you gotta kind of hit it from, uh, fr- from, from both of those angles. Christy, preach, totally agree with the SEO. Yeah, SEO is so overblown. It was bigger, if we were talking 10 years ago, you could do some damage with SEO, but my God, how many web pages and websites are out there? And Google's algorithm, here, I'll give you guys a little insider tip. I have never heard anyone talk about this. I'm sure it's somewhere. I have never heard anyone talk about this. Do you know that Google's algorithm is now stripping and reading um, closed captionings in videos and considering the closed captions in the context of its SEO ranking algorithm? Google is way freaking smarter than people who are looking at just like keywords and how I'm going to like write around them. They're literally reading your, your closed captions, which one means you need closed captions, which two means, oh man, Google is now taking the context of videos into the search algorithm. Think about that, which is also though, also seriously, why you need to be partnered up with agencies, companies, and businesses that are thinking that way, that know that that's what Google is doing and considering that in part of your strategy. Most people don't know that. There's so many little nuances. That's the thing. In the last three months and in the next three months, there's going to be stuff that changes all over the place. You know, we invest in having people just constantly, not even just doing research for clients, researching what's happening on the platforms, finding little hacks, little different things, things that people don't know about, aren't talking about, finding ways to, wow, Google is now indexing closed captioning and videos. Great. Well, we now need to make sure there's closed captioning on clients, content on blog posts that's at the top, above the fold. Like there's some crazy stuff. So like you can game it still a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's just having really good content that people care about and just being like basically aware of SEO. All right. Do you see value farming out online marketing to external fir- forms or does it dilute your message? If it's the right company, it's absolutely imperative to partner up 
um, you know, with, a, with an external marketing uh, firm, because here's what can happen. You know, there's because the old traditional model doesn't work anymore and brands are feeling it. And so they're bringing stuff in house or cutting agencies loose because agencies have really not been able to show their value in the last five to 10 years uh, as much as they had before. They have less to hide behind. And so brands are feeling it and they're saying, hey, you know, we just bring this in house. You could probably do as good of a job, if not better. And then we control it. We can move a little quicker, maybe. And in the short term, that might actually work. Here's the problem. And it goes to what I was talking about with like the SEO and stuff. You're now in your own silo. The only stuff you see, the only data you see, the only information that you see proprietarily is just your own. And when you put that mask over your face and think that you're going to solve all your problems in a box, it's never going to happen. It might work for a couple of years. It might even work for a while. But at some point, other companies, brands are going to get ahead of you because they have partners that are seeing what's happening across the board. That's the value of an ad agency. If the agency actually sticks with the times because you can have a vision externally of what's going on because we're not just looking at one client stream of data. We're looking at dozens and dozens of client streams of data and aggregating it and looking at patterns across the board so we can make decisions faster for all of our companies because we know what's going on. That's the value, right? And we're researching just general trends that are happening and little, you know, little nuances here and there. So if it's the right partner and they're doing those things, absolutely makes sense to have an external partner. If, if they're not doing those things, dude, either bring it in house or find a different partner. Or if you're small and it just doesn't make sense for you yet, then, then you don't, you know, doesn't necessarily need to be considered. Um, how much do you think Bold is going to grow in the next five years? Oh, I mean, we're, we're definitely trying to get to the over $100 million mark in the next, uh, well, we're trying in 12 months, but it's probably going to take a few years. So we're just going to continue to grow because I really strongly believe that, you know, it's not just about growth for us. It really is that, man, the stuff... I, I'll tell you, and I can't speak specifically, I will tell you, in all honesty, I ha we have taken accounts from big ad agencies, substantially bigger than us, with people, you know, with clients that might not be the biggest clients, but have multiple, multiple, multiple millions of dollars in ad spend annually, and we've taken accounts over, and we've looked at the stuff, and we're like, oh my God, dude, they didn't even have a Facebook pixel on your website, and they've been charging you hundreds of thousands of dollars retainer a month, what the hell is going on? And so when I see that stuff, I just feel so sick that there are companies and agencies that are selling this stuff because they just are trying to stay alive. And then they're telling them to buy TV ads. And then they're like, well, how did it work? Oh, well, the, the agency said that it did really well. We got you know 20 million impressions. I don't give a crap about impressions, dude. Where are your sales? Well, they're still trending down over the last five years. What? Dude, oh, I feel bad. I feel bad. I feel like people are getting ripped off left and right. And so when we can step in and genuinely have the client's best interest in mind, not have any vested interest in media companies or any tech companies where we literally just like, dude, we can tell you exactly what we would tell you to do. And guess what? We're doing it ourselves. It's a great partnership. And we're focused just on getting you results. It would be insane for us to not grow to that size and beyond. It would be, it, it, I, we would be doing a disservice. Okay, last couple, last couple. If you're not growing, you're dying. Dude, 100%, man, 100%, Dylan. Are you looking to hire account executives to sell your services? We're always hiring, man, we're growing. So, you know, definitely touch base, DM me. I, I, you know, who knows it'll work out. I can at least put you in touch with the right folks here at Bold. All right, um, Robert. Speaking of big clients, what is the minimum budget to work with your agency, uh, own a small photography studio? Look, I mean, you know, our, our clients, even on the smallest scale, are, are spending multiple, multiple six figures annually on marketing at the absolute, like, smallest end. Doesn't mean that we can't or haven't done stuff with clients or even smaller than that, meaning, like, you know, we've put together some strategies where, listen, a client can't afford to work with us on an ongoing basis or afford for us to execute it. But hey, let's put a, we can put a strategy together and say, here's the things you need to do in the order, train some people. So there's different ways of working together, but we're definitely working with clients that are, that are probably, you know, a bit, a bit bigger in the, in the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars plus at the small end. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that there's not opportunities and there might be more opportunities because as we're growing, we're also looking at like, how do we service or how do we help outside of just our content, some of the smaller, smaller businesses. Um, and so there's, there's going to be stuff that pops up, you know, from an opportunity basis from us on the real, real small businesses or the micro businesses or startups. But right now, um, yeah, it, re it really depends. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, listen, thank you all for watching. 
and tuning in. It's uh, it's amazing. I appreciate it. It's been cool. It's been fun. It's been real. Um, you know, it's uh, it's just cool. T- totally, totally clicked the wrong button there. That was cool, man. This is like real live TV, right? It's awesome. Look, graphic goes on, graphic goes off. Um, anyway, really cool. I thank you all for tuning in. This has been a lot of fun. I hope it's been valuable. If it has been valuable, comment. Let me know. If it hasn't been valuable or I didn't answer your question, comment. Let me know. I really want to know. And um, we're going to do this every single Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern. Make sure to tune in. Uh, tell anybody that you feel that this is going to be valuable for because we're trying to just continue to grow the audience, get this messaging out there. I'm not selling you anything. Again, my hope is that, listen, if we keep keep doing this, helping businesses grow, put this out there, that the right size companies that want to do business with us, with us will. But at the end of the day, if they don't, but we can help them because of something we said or did or showed them. Dude, that's awesome, man. I want everyone to succeed. I want to see you succeed. And I'm not bullshitting. I really do. I want to see you be super successful. I want to see you grow your company. I want to see you enjoy life. I want to see you have fun while you're doing it. I want to see everybody grow and be successful. So anyway, listen, thank you for tuning in. Make sure to always be bold and tune in next Thursday at 1 p.m. And next Tuesday, we'll drop another episode of Growing Bold. Thank you.